Welcome to the Whiskey Vault. Today we're going to talk theoretical mathematics and psychology because I'm definitely qualified to do that. <laughs> I'm Daniel Whittington, Chancellor of the Wizard Academy Whiskey Marketing School. We're going to talk about Bayes' theorem, which is something I learned about recently and was looking into, and I fell in love with the idea of it immediately, and I went down this rabbit hole of videos and books and articles just trying to understand it. And I'm going to try to simplify it here into like a set eight minute video because <laughs> it is a simple idea. But I think the reason I fell in love with it is because it's a great mathematical scientific idea that helps you come to healthier, more accurate conclusions. But I think it's also a great potential psychological tool for the era that we currently live in to help Get yourself closer and closer to the truth in the things that you believe. So Thomas Bayes is an English minister and a mathematician. When he died, which was 1761, so before America even existed, <laughs> uh, a, a Richard Price published his notes. And in his notes was this thing called Bayes' Theorem. And you can look it up online, you can see the mathematical equation. And if you know that kind of math, like if you're getting into, actually it looks very similar to like physics math, mathematics uh, to the bare, just to the naked eye, if you're looking at the shapes of things. Um, anyway, his, his theorem is a philosophical viewpoint, which is that the belief that you can never access absolute 100% truth. And so all that you can do is have an idea and then take incoming data and then look at not whether or not it's true or false or whether it proved you true or proved you wrong, but simply look at, given this new data, is my belief more likely to be true or less likely to be true based on this new piece of information? That's it. And that's all you have to conclude, right? So prior belief, your initial understanding of the some, probability of something being true, and then new evidence goes into the mathematical equation, and then probability, and uh, uh, which how likely is this to change this in which direction, and then the posterior belief, what direction did this take my belief? Did it make my original theoretical belief more true if this was true, or less true if this was true? And... That sounds super nerdy. <laughs> it's a complete counter to confirmation bias. Now, I don't know if you know what confirmation bias is, but you should. It's the opposite of the scientific method, basically. The scientific method says, I believe this. Now I'm gonna spend the next year trying to prove that wrong. <laughs> That's a scientific method when it's done correctly, right? I think this is true. How does it break? Which is ironic, because that's kind of how my brain works. when I'm like brainstorming with people or with coworkers and we're trying to come up with an idea or solution and someone says, I think we should do this. My first reaction is like, okay, where does that break? Right? And that's the, the simplest version of the scientific method. Confirmation bias is when you say, this is what I believe and then you only go researching and collecting data that reinforces what you already believed. And anything that doesn't match that, you ignore it as false data, or uh, irrelevant conclusions. And so you end up with this, you know, uh, research paper of 20 pages, all that prove your point. And anyone with any level of research goes in and looks at it and they're like, well, what about this, 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 that all disprove your point. <laughs> oh, well, those are, and then you just start, you know, whitewashing all that stuff out. That's confirmation bias. As humans, okay, wait, first I'm going to talk about the whiskey, and then I'm going to come back to why I think this matters for us right now as not just a way to get better at making good whiskey or at the scientific method or at research. Old Granddad 114. I, I think there's another underrated, all that's not underrated by the whiskey nerd friends of mine, um, for a $30 less $25 to $30 bottle of 114 proof whiskey. That's from Jim Beam, and it's got a history going back to Basil Hayden. 
uh, founding it in Kentucky in the 1800s as a Catholic, bringing his whole congregation down. Like, what a cool brand. For 25, 30 bucks, I have yet to find a Beam product, and that includes Basil Hayden, and at these price points, that combats this, right? Wild Turkey comes close. 101 is not $30, $25 anymore, but, but still, I think this is a great one. And what I really love about it is you can do comparisons to the other products like the 80 proof release, the bottled and bond release, and the 114, and you can see variations based on production variations that they do, but it, it gives you the ability to see how much batching and slight alterations on cuts and barrel proof entries can affect the same base spirits, and it's really nerdy fun. So, in the nose, immediately, it's that classic dust, corn dust, roasted peppercorn sort of black spicy toasted oak note. There's a little bit of a hollow in the middle that makes it feel kind of open and lifted. So on the high end, really kind of spicy and uh, rye forward on the corn dust and on the back end, oaky and a little bit wooden and this little kind of hollow in the middle. I think that little hollow in the middle is what throws people sometimes. Oh man, it just goes for days. Dense oak, sweet tea, corn dust, not quite peanuts, but a little bit nutty. Yeah, it's just, man, for a $25 bottle of bourbon, like, you, like this should be, they've tried to discontinue it over the years and fans are all like, no, what, 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 what are you doing? <laughs> uh, maybe it will be again, who knows? Uh, it was introduced, this line was introduced in the 1970s by National Distillers, and then they sold it in the 80s to, uh, to the Beam Distilling Conglomerate. Uh, Beam took over Old Granddad, Old Crow, and Old Taylor that they then sold later. Um, but the National Stillers bought it from, what was it, the Wathan family? Anyway, it went through a bunch of ownership of like all, it wasn't just Basil Hayden. The ownership of this brand line of Old Granddad traded hands from like famous historical bourbon name to the other. Just right down the line. <laughs> I mean, it encountered the Dant family, the, the Wathan family, the National Distillers Corporation, the Beams, the, the, I mean, good Lord, pretty cool. And old granddad, that picture is actually Basil Hayden on the front. So I dig this one. A little water and it gets a little drier and a little more oaky. Sweet peanuts. Mm, and in the taste... It is that, like, you ever go into a shop, in a gift shop somewhere at a park that has, like, the candy-coated nuts of various kinds? It's headed that direction, this sort of, like, nutty, waxy, but super sugar-coated sweetness, a little bit wooden. It's nice. Okay, so why does Bayes' theorem matter to us? Well, all psychology tells you if you view your belief as right or wrong, black or white, not only are you less likely to be correct, but also very unlikely to change or be open to change when presented with conflicting data. If you view truth as a binary equation where you can either be 100% right or 100% wrong, then you can only be good or bad, and there's no gray, there's no variation. But that's not how knowledge works. Our brains are too easily manipulated, our brains are too flexible, we're too easily influenced by our surroundings and our upbringing and the people in our circle and whatever we ate that day. <laughs> and so there's no world in, in which we know a fact to a true 100%. We just, based on all of our information, it's as close to 100% as reasonably possible on certain things. But most knowledge is some level of gray. And if you view the world as like, I believe this, and you're either going to say something and agree with me, or you're going to say something and then try to convince me I'm wrong, then that's the wrong way to learn. 
It's the wrong way to grow. It's the long way to get closer to the truth. And if you are trying to get somebody closer to the truth, there's a lot of psychology that shows the worst thing you could do is show them the ways in which they're wrong. That what it tends to have in psychology is the opposite effect. All the studies show that if someone has a firmly held belief and you just come at them with facts that contradict their belief, the likelihood that they change is much lower than the likelihood that they dig their own hole deeper. Well, you know what? Screw your facts. Fake news. <laughs> right? That's, that's human psychology. That's not just the era we're living in. That's how all of us work. Not on one side or the other. That's how all of us tend to work. And so what I like about Bayes' theorem is it offers a sort of sidestep, non-confrontational approach to just consider. That's all I'm asking. Just consider. Not is it true, but... If it was true, would it make your core belief more likely to be true or less likely to be true? That's all I'm asking. I'm not asking you to firmly just say, if this was true, and then we can do the research if you want to, would it make your belief more or less likely? I love the way that that approaches conversation, right? So I have this thought. Uh, and so I was, talking to, I was talking to my son about this because... Uh, he has ADHD and he forgets things and uh, uh, very easily. I have, I'm, I'm not ADHD, but I've got some sympathetic overlap with some, my brain does weird things. And I also am famous for like walking around and leaving a trail of my belongings behind me everywhere I go. If I had given my son, you know, three very important gifts in January for his birthday, and over the next three months, I discovered that he had lost all three of them. And my conclusion was, well, Jackson doesn't care about me. He doesn't care about the gifts that I give him. And he's an ungrateful son. How dare he? Okay, so there's my starting point, which is kind of a dick move, but there's my starting point. If someone was to come to me and say, that's not true, you know he loves you, he just, you know, so, and then you, what you end up with is like, well, yeah, I know he says he loves me, but if he truly loved me, would he care for, you see how that starts that conversation? It's like, oh yeah, well, what about, what about, and it's just instant conflict. But if someone says, look, you know that Jackson has ADHD, right? I'm like, yes. And one of the core components of ADHD brains is the ability to very quickly forget about the one thing that you held in your hand or that you were carrying somewhere or that you were focused on when you're distracted by one other thing that all of a sudden gets a higher level of importance. And it's very common for ADHD people to leave a string of things in various places and or lose them forever, right? Is that true? Yes, that's true. And Jackson has ADHD, also true. Say, so given that information, this, new, this piece of data, does that make your theory that Jackson is an ungrateful son who doesn't care about what you give him more likely or less likely to be true? Well, the answer is, if I was to take in that into consideration, it makes my original response less likely to be true. And all of a sudden, I have to think about that. Maybe there's something I haven't considered what's more likely. You see what I mean? I think in the, in the conflict of extreme conversations that we're in right now, this idea can be very helpful for having conversations instead of antagonistic verbal battles or written battles for that matter. So hopefully that is helpful to you. I'll put a link uh, to one of the articles that I really loved, but I, I think of it as a mathematical approach to humility. Cheers to you, and I'm really glad you're here. What's more likely, have I brought you valuable information, or have I wasted another 15 minutes of your day? I don't know. Like and subscribe.